Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, today we're concluding the part of the book about um, about the the tools for effective models. Um, the second, I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, uh, and the specific chapter we're going to talk about is the screening many models chapter. Um, if if we're uh, like looking at this chapter in the perspective of the whole book, um, the idea is to present an entire uh, like workflow, so to say. Um, uh, it's just like you know, also the name of the uh, tidy models object workflow, but also like. A flow of work um, that encapsulates how to uh, utilize all of the knowledge that we've been through so far uh, in the book, including um, resampling and tuning um, and uh, grid search and so forth. Um, so that's, um, that's the idea of the chapter. And unlike um, other chapters, it doesn't include any uh, theoretical ideas or notions, rather it is very technical, meaning it shows you how to specifically perform all of these operations. Um, so this is what we're going to do today, and we'll see how to uh, utilize the idea of a workflow set, which is the, the main concept of this chapter. And using this idea of the workflow set, we're going to see how we can uh, tune and evaluate them. Um, and also, finally, how to use uh, ra racing approaches and find them as um, the best model. So the, the idea is we have we have seen uh, different uh, uh, ways to work with, with the specific models. And the idea of a workflow set is to work with uh, many models at once. Um, okay. Just a second. Okay, never mind. Um, so this is today. Um, I, I will say that uh, we're going to just go over this workflow and see how, how it's conducted. Um, so this might be a bit shorter than usual. And also because um, because of this creation of many models, I won't be doing the live coding. Um, unlike uh, unlike previous um, meetings of ours, um, because you know, just like uh, uh, they said that, that in the book, the um, the tuning of their workflow set took about two hours on a on a good uh, computer. Um, so, you know, two hours is too much for us. So, um, we'll just do, we won't do any live coding, just go over the notes from the previous cohorts. Um, we'll start by, uh, some setup. Um, so the first cohort decided to work with another data set, like not the cement, uh, data set, but the 2021 world happiness report. Um, because it's both more interesting, it has like more social no notions, and also it's very small, it's uh, 149 rows. Um, so um, the, uh, the data set is available in the GitHub repository. Um, and if we're using the scheme function from scheme R, uh, we can see that uh, this uh, data set has uh, 149 um, rows, 20 columns um, with uh, these two are the character columns of country name and the region in the world, like West Europe and so forth. Um, and these are the numeric um, variables. Um, the relevant for us are, uh, is the first one, the ladder score, which is like the, the, the happiness score of the country. Um, and the six more uh, variables from a G log GDP per capita and uh, the other ones. Um, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, 
and perceptions of corruption. Um, so these are the six indicators that um, in some way or another um, combine for the lattice score. Um, and we have more uh, variables underneath that we won't use. Um, so the idea is that we're, we're taking um, the data frame that we've just imported and imported, and we're selecting these seven variables into DF selected, okay? So our goal, what we uh, strive to achieve is to predict the ladder score using uh, these six predictors. Um, so uh, that's basically uh, the idea. Um, we have some code uh, using the core correlate um, function to look at the correlation between, uh, between the different variables. Um, we can see that it's mostly um, a positive uh, correlation between uh, the different uh, variables to the lattice score. Um, we do see here that we have a negative correla correlation for perceptions, perceptions of corruption, um, which makes sense because if corruption is lower then um, happiness might be higher. And we see that generosity isn't that well correlated with the outcome variable. Um, so this is basically it. And we can also visualize this um, using this plot, but it's not very relevant um, for our cause. Um, so this is like the basic uh, introduction of the data. Um, okay, just a second. Perfect. So after we've uh, conducted an initial, initial uh, introduction to the data set, we're going to create um, the workflow set, which is the focal point of today's meeting. Um, first, some setup. And I will say that the, the way they chose to perform this operation um, or operations throughout uh, this chapter is with this idea of like, um, uh, using the outcome variable as a string and also converting it to a symbol using this sim function. And then throughout the chapter, um, you can just, um, they use like the call y or call y sim um, variables um, or objects. And, and then the idea is that uh, you can, if you want to, for example, um, replace the outcome variable, you, you only need to change it in one place, which is here, the call y uh, string. And then afterwards, the, the all the other uh, places just change when you run the same code. Um, so this is the idea why they chose to do it, but you can just uh, use, you know, like lattice score here in straight up. Um, so this is like this initial setup. And then we split the data set. We take the DF selected, um, our data set with seven columns, and we create an initial split stratified by uh, the outcome variable, uh, which, as we've talked about previously, is always a good, uh, uh, considered best practice, or almost always. After we create the split, we create our training and our testing data, and we create a um, Sorry, uh, v fold cross validation um, with five repeats on, of course, the training data. Um, so this is um, this is our um, uh, cross validation technique, and as you can see, uh, the folds here we have um, uh, it's repeated five times because we have uh, five repeats. So we have uh, a total of 50 rows, which is uh, 10 times five. Perfect. Um, so after we created this initial um, splits and cross validation, um, let's go and create a recipe. Um, so the first, uh, recipe, um, or before the recipe, um, they created a formula here for um, like the 
for the recipes or for the predictions. Um, and as you can see here, it's just the call Y, the, our uh, outcome predictor. Um, and they chose to do it like with paste and um, just uh, predict with all other columns in the data. Um, so this is the formula. The first recipe just utilizes this formula, okay? Um, please see and uh, watch that, you know, they uh, use like the training uh, data and use the migrator pipe operator and then use the dot to um, to note that the data is this data set. Um, so the recipe uses the formula and then it normalizes all the predictors, step normalize using the recipes package uh, as we've seen before. So this is our first recipe, just a basic normalized predictors, okay? Uh, and obviously we could have done it uh, on numeric predictors uh, as well, but we only have numeric predictors here, so it doesn't matter. Uh, the second recipe is um, is, is based on the first recipe okay, using the step normalized, but then it adds two more steps. Okay, so we have uh, a polynomial step, which means that uh, all predictors predictors also receive um, a, how it's called uh, a quadratic quadratic equation, um, like. Um, on to the power of two for uh, so every predictor also creates another predictor to the power of two and also uh, an interaction step meaning um, all predictors are uh, after you know these uh, this uh, polynomial step are interacted with each other to create more uh, more predictors and this just you know it shows the power of recipes to create this uh, uh, using this very simple line of code rather than creating this huge formula, um, which is much more complicated. Um, so this is uh, our recipes, okay? Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay, so now we need to create um, model specification, okay? Um, and we want to create model specifications for a lot of different models, okay, or model engines. Um, so a cool thing that I've seen in the first cohort's uh, YouTube um, uh, recording is this um, Parsnip add-in to RStudio. So I'll just show it in a sec. Okay, um, so this is our studio. It's a, as you can see, it's a, it's a blank um, session. Um, and you see here we have add-ins. Um, and I'm going to use the Parsnip generate Parsnip model specification add-in, um, which is equivalent to running this code. Okay, Parsnip three. Uh, colons and parsnip add-in, and it uh, creates this uh, window here in the viewer, okay? Um, which just shows us all of different types of models and model engines that exist within parsnip for either classification or regression, okay? So for example, if you would, you would like to um, create why doesn't it click? Sorry. Very weird. Okay, so I just, okay, I needed to click, click on the letters rather than the radio button. So the, here we have all of Parsnip's uh, regression models. Um, so for example, we can take a Baggins tree and a Boosted tree and Decision tree. Uh, and uh, linear regression from GLM, and uh, let's just see, random forest from Ranger, and uh, SVM RBF that we've seen before. Okay, so I, I just like randomly chose some uh, 
uh, some variables. Oh, here I see Freya is joining. Um, hi, Freya, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Sorry that I'm late, you came up. Yeah, great, that's fine. So I'm just, uh, we're in the middle of the presentation of the chapter and I'm just seeing, um, uh, or presenting how to use the parsnip add-in for uh, easily writing model specifications. Right. Um, so as you can see here, you're able to just use this line of code or use it within the add-ins and the uh, parsnip, generate parsnip model specification. Here. So after we selected um, the models that we want, we just um, create a new um, like R or QMD or whatever um, file. And then we click this nice button, write specification code. And bam, we have here all of these model specification just wrote, written for us, okay? Also, you can see for relevant models, for example, here in the XG boost, uh, boosted tree, um, it's uh, it's adding uh, a relevant uh, tuning uh, function arguments um, where where it's relevant for the model. So um, this is a very nice and quick and easy way to create a whole lot of model specification and without needing to like come back each time to the documentation of each model and to decide okay so. Uh, which specific model would I like to tune and so forth. So um, this was a really nice uh, re revelation for me. Um, so that, that's just uh, a little something that I wanted to show. Uh, and I'll come back to the chapter itself. Um, just a second. Okay, um, so that's, that's the way to create the model specifications. And if we click here, we can see like these model specification for a uh, different kind of, uh, of models, okay? Um, so we see here um, a model specification for uh, uh, linear regression using the Glimnet uh, engine. We see um, a Mars engine. Um, another uh, uh, SVN, a support vector machine, uh, a polynomial uh, support vector machine, K and N, um, decision tree, Baggins tree, random forest, boosted tree, okay? So, uh, and uh, Cubis tree with, with which I'm not that familiar with. Um, so these are all different model specifications. And what's important is that this code was created the way I showed you earlier with the with the parsnip add-in. Um, so this is these are all the model specifications, and here is a nice uh, meme for how we felt after creating these ten recipes. And thank you, SpongeBob. Okay. Um, so the idea is after we created the recipes and the model specification is to create the, this object of a workflow set, okay? Which is um, compiled of two different arguments, the pre-processing or pre-processor or um, recipes, a list of recipes and um, a list of models, okay? Now we give each one of them a name which will uh, act as the either the prefix or the suffix of um, each workflow ID. Okay, so for example, here we create um, a workflow set with only like the um, step normalize. This is the recipe here um, with three different models, okay, which need um, these, uh, which are relevant for only this uh, pre-processing step. Uh, and we get this uh, object of a workflow set, which is um, basically a table with other properties um, or an attributes um, added to it, okay? So it's uh, well suited for, for, our, um, for our, our work. So each workflow ID, as you can see, is uh, prefixed with the norm because we use the norm, we named the, our, uh, our preprocessor on norm. 
and the name of each model. Um, and the workflow set has some info, options, and results, list columns. Um, after that, we create another workflow set, uh, which uh, utilizes the polynomial recipe um, for, um, for the, I can't remember which model is the LR one, but for this one and also for the uh, KNN model. And then we create another work, work, workflow set, um, which just uses our, basically our formula. This is the only like pre processing, so to say, which doesn't contain any pre processing, just the formula itself um, for different kinds of models for like decision trees and random forests and boosted trees and so forth. Um, so we have, right now, we have three different uh, workflow sets. Okay, this is our third one. And we're going to bind the three of them together. Okay, so we have uh, the sets norm, sets poly, and sets simple. We're binding them together. Um, and just the, because for aesthetic reasons, they chose to um, remove the simple um, prefix from the some of the ideas uh, of the workflows. Um, and then we get this sets object, which is a workflow containing 11 model specifications um, in or 11 workflow objects. Uh, for each, uh, we have uh, both a recipe and a model specification relevant for each object. Um, so I guess the most of the work is creating this object, is deciding um, which uh, model specifications am I using and which pre-processing steps are relevant for this model specification and creating this workflow set. Um, are there any questions right to this point? Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, so this was these were the okay. hard steps. Come yeah, on. yes, well, Fami, of course. Well, okay, so on. let me comment uh, based on the workflow says, you know, we have the preprocessor and also the model. So that means if I pass in just uh, one preprocessor, it's going to apply those preprocessing steps to all the model. So the idea is, um, let me just go up for a sec. Okay, so this is the way we create a workflow set, right? We specify uh, pre-processing as a list. You know, that's, a, um, I'll use this example. I think it's better. Um, so we pass, we create this workflow set uh, and we have two main arguments, the pre-processor and the model, okay? So for each of them, we give a named list, okay? In each of the cases we have here, um, the pre-processing, um, uh, list only has one item in the list, okay? But if we would have given the list like a list with two or three uh, named preprocessors, then what we would have gotten is like this, like kind of like expand grid, okay? So like all of the different possible combinations. So uh, we have like a normalized recipe and we have a polynomial recipe and we have um, I don't know, uh, uh, U Johnson transformation uh, recipe, uh, but, and, and we wanted like different recipes. So we would provide a um, list with three um, different recipes. And then uh, the workflow set uh, um, function would create all of the different combinations. Uh, the reason that we are not doing it here is as I understand, um, some of these recipes are, aren't relevant for all kinds of models. So we just, uh, do it like this in a more like broken down kind of way. Um, does this answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it's also um, what uh, Ovofemi um, just noted is an important uh, emphasis that it's possible to just use this called workflow set once and we just supply all the different um, like 
recipes and just create it once if again if the recipe and the and the steps that, that, that are included in it are relevant for the model types. Okay, so I'm going back to our object of a workflow set, which has all of these 11 different model specifications. Um, and each of the um, info here, uh, um, it has like the uh, recipes and so forth. Um, okay, so after we created this workflow set, we're going to um, basically fit the models and tune them, okay? So we need to create a, uh, a control grid, okay? As we've seen uh, before in chapters, I think it was 13, if I'm not mistaken, or either 14, I think it was 13, yeah. So we create a control grid, um, we uh, ask to save the predictions, uh, use parallel computing uh, wherever it's available, and save the workflows uh, uh, objects that uh, that we have. Don't throw them away. And then we just use our sets, which I remind you is the workflow set table, and we use this function of workflow map. Okay, we provided a seed so it would be uh, reproducible, uh, and we provide the the folds. We give it an argument of the number of uh, grid points, so to say. Okay, so for each um, for each uh, tuning um, hypers or for each uh, hyperparameters tuning space how many points to create in each of these spaces, so three. We provide the, the control grid as a control uh, argument, and we ask it to be verbose, meaning that uh, we uh, we want to see in the console during the, the fitting process um, how it's doing. Um, so basically, this is it, okay? So we create the workflow set, we define a control grid, and then we use the workflow map function. And this just um, is basic, basically uh, fitting thousands of models, you know, for each resample, for each poll, for each uh, model specification, and so forth, um, for each uh, uh, point in the control grid. Um, and it, it's uh, tuning all of these models. Okay, so this is like the basic idea. And then we get, um, it's it, it takes a lot of time, uh, as they also uh, say in the chapter. And then we need, to, after it's finished, we need to rank the models. Um, this shows us how many models that we have during um, the, um, this analysis. In, in this analysis, we have 3,000 models, okay? Um, and then, sorry. Um, I can't remember, it says because, oh yeah, because uh, this uh, decision to our uh, bag industry has some problems in the result column, so we filter it out. Um, and then uh, we rank it, okay? Um, so we use the workflow sets rank results function, and we need to specify uh, which uh, metric would, would we like to rank with. Um, sorry. Um, this one I can't remember. Okay, so I guess this is just a, like a bug fix for the, for some reason R squared wasn't filtered out, but fine. Um, okay. So after all of this like slicing and dicing and, and whatnot, um, we're able to rank our, our results, okay? I think that um, the chapter um, shows like a specific function to do it. 
uh, I'm not sure why they decided to do it this way. Um, the important thing is that um, we save this to um, a ranks object, and then um, each each workflow has like its workflow idea, um, the model name, um, which specific configuration it came from, like which preprocessor, which model number, so forth, and its rank and uh, RMSC um, metric. If we plot it, um, it's possible also using the autoplot function, but it would be seen a little bit different. Um, we can see that Specifically here, the um, normalized support vector machine polynomial um, model had the best results of, with the lower lowest RMSC. Um, so and and the whiskers are like you know because we have for each model we have um, more than one. Um, we have a lot of uh, different folds and resamples and so forth. Um, and so this is one way to use the autoplot function. Again, what's shown here is like a, a ggplot um, alternative because they wanted to look at it like in this way, but the autoplot function presents something a bit similar. Okay, so this is how so this is how the autoplot function would um, show this ranking. Sorry. Oh no, it jumped. Okay, here. Okay. Um, so this is how the autoplot function where would see it would show it. So we have the RMC on the y-axis, on the and on the x-axis we have the rank. So the leftmost is the best. Um, like highest rank, you know, lower number. And the code for it is, as you see, autoplot and grid results using all of these uh, different arguments. But here in the uh, notes, they decided to do it different. Um, they did use the autoplot um, with the uh, rest grid um, object. Um, and with if you provide an idea of a specific model, for example, our best model, the polynomial support vector machine model, um, and ask uh, to plot it with the RMSC metric, um, we can see like the, uh, how to say, um, the hyperparameter tuning uh, space, okay? Um, like the different sub-models. Okay, uh, specifically for for this kind of model, it had only one parameter. Um, so, like, and again, we we said we for each model type, where we we have three different um, uh, grid points for for tuning. So these are the three uh, grid points, and this one was the one was finally chosen. <clears throat> um. Okay, so this is how we rank them. Okay, so we've seen how to code it to get this table. We've seen how to plot it and also how to plot the specific model. Uh, and the last uh, step is to finalize the model. Um, okay. Um, so here we do some... Uh, um, pre uh, some coding just to get like the ID of the best workflow um, using the slice min function, okay? To get like the object with the highest rank. Um, we get, <clears throat> sorry, the, um, the best workflow object, okay? Um, using our uh, grid object and then um, using this function of extract wor workflow set results using the workflow ID best, like this idea that we've just found. So uh, we're selecting it here. Again, this is uh, this the, the reason to perform this preliminary step 
is to create like a, a more uh, general generalized reproducible uh, method of wo working. Um, so we it won't be if, for example, if something changes and we have an, another workflow idea, then we wouldn't have to change this. And we're selecting uh, the best one using the RMSC. Uh, after we've chosen the best workflow, we just fit the best one. So we, again, we select the grid, um, we extract the workflow and we finalize it. After we finalize, we perform a last fit okay, using our split. And I remind you that the split contains um, uh, training data and testing data. So uh, Tidy Models knows that uh, if you uh, perform a last fit function and you provide the split object, then it, it needs to use the testing data set rather than the training data set. Um, and after, yeah, Fred. Yeah, um, could I ask, what does finalize workflow do here? Um, as I understand it, um, it, um, it, it's, it's like, um, I think, actually, that's a good, good question. Maybe Federica would be willing to, to elaborate on this if, if you know, but I think it's just performs this step, um, one more time. Like you say to it, okay, so. Um, REST grid is like um, um, a result of a grid fine-tuning fine for like this entire workflow set. So this is cho choosing a specific workflow. And this is like saying, okay, I want um, a specific workflow after all of the um, pre-processing and tuning and model selection and so forth, so forth, because as I understand it, um, the workflow sets objects, it, it has like, um, it has different columns, okay? So again, as I understand it, I might be wrong, but the workflow object, um, like the different objects remain in different uh, columns. Okay, so you have the workflow column, you have the pre-processing column and so forth. And the finalized workflow, it's just like combines them together for a single workflow object to be able to create the last fit. Um, that's how I understand it, but you know what? That's a good, um, we might be able to Google it for a second. Having a quick look in the chapter, but it doesn't, Quite give details and so, but thank you. Like the way you've explained it, like that would make sense. I think. Um, I um, I like to to add that you just to uh, finalize when you have chosen your uh, best model, and so you do the final fit. So you finalize the workflow. You do the. Uh, you apply just uh, the, the model that you've chosen and then um, fit it again the, for the last time. Isn't that what yes, last uh, fit is doing? I, I think, yeah. So I think the difference is that finalize um, is taking like the tuning parameters, as they say here, and just updates the workflow object. And the last fit is performing the entire fitting uh, procedure on the testing data set rather than on the training data set. So finalize meaning just, as I understand it says, given all that we know on this object, like what are the best tuning parameters and what are the best pre-processing steps and so forth, let's create this specific workflow and then um, the last fit means let's um, apply this workflow on the testing data set. So this is how I understand. Oh, sounds good, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so this is finalized workflow. 
And after we've we've created the um, last fit um, object, which we call fit best, um, then we collect the metrics for it using this collect metrics function, and we can see uh, our RMSC and R square um, metrics. RMSC uh, has a value of uh, 0.514. Um, if we'll go back um, to the end of the previous subchapter, we'll see that it was 0.513. So it means that we have um, a really good, um, 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 I would say, it's very similar, the RMSC of the training and the tasting data. So it's a good sign that the procedure went well. Um, so this is the RMSC and the R square is, I guess, pretty high of uh, 0.816. Um, and we can also plot the uh, observed versus predicted scatter plot, you know, for um, which is, one of the reasons we're using testing data set um, because we know what what are the um, like real, so to say, values, like the observed values rather than the predicted. So this is um, the scatter plot for the predicted versus observed. And just a, a quick note on that is uh, they used here, um, besides, you know, the you, you have the collect predictions function. Um, and then it's just like basic um, ggplot code. But then you have this function that I wasn't aware, aware, of, aware of, which is the chord obs spread, uh, which just creates like, uh, it's it both creates like um, a, co a coordinates um, function where um, the x and y axes are equal. Um, both in uh, scale and in limits. And also it creates those nice uh, labels, uh, access labels. So it's a really handy function that I wasn't aware of. Oh, sorry. The labels aren't um, aren't created. That's here, that's a good. So it's just like a, a coordinates uh, function, but it does come in hand. Um, so this is another way to, um, to um, test ourselves and um, besides looking at the R square metric to see uh, like the distribution of all of the data points and uh, how how they fare between the, obviously not all data points, just the testing data points, boy, points but um, how they fare um, between predicted and observed values. Um, so this is basically the idea. As I said, it was pretty much technical um, not not a lot of theory, but for me it was um, it was really nice just looking at um, how to perform this, uh, you know, very practically, and it helped me understand how I can utilize this um, entire workflow in my, uh, and the, utilize the idea of workflow sets in my day to day. So it made the, this idea of before I started reading the the book of you know. Uh, using a, a lot of models, which I I mean might not be like uh, best uh, with the best knowledge about like the theory behind each and every one of them, which is it's just you know creating a very accessible workflow. Yeah. Just create all of these models and to and to fit them and compare them and to tune them and to see which one works best. Um, so this is basically it, and I'll be happy to. We'll hear more from you, or you can, if you have any more questions, so feel free. Yeah. That was very nice. Thank you. It seems like quite a sort of a nice way of doing things and comparing models. It seems quite sort of smooth. Yeah. So I, I was wondering um, if uh, some of you come from a more like, um, uh, like machine learning, like prediction type of work, or you? Because personally, when I do happen to use um, like more models and so forth, it's more like inference, um, and uh, you know, like uh, 
uh, p values and uh, like you know looking at um, uh, like hypothesis testing rather than uh, pre uh, prediction creation. So and, and I guess um, it's relevant for inference, but I think it's like this workflow is more uh, built for for like machine learning um, prediction. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I think the kind of um, like you, the inference p values kind of comes more naturally. But I so I kind of have to get my head around this way of doing things. But I do do some of this as well, so I think I can see myself using this system. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, and for me, what 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 it, it has done is like created like a motivation, like you know do like more like uh, small projects to see where like more prediction oriented work might come in handy. Um, Federico or Wafemi, would you like uh, to to add something or to uh, anything? I don't have anything to add. I think uh, I don't have anything to add for now. Okay, perfect, thank you. But I still um, think uh, what we have learned so far in the chapter, I think is going to be very useful to make us the study which uh, we are working on currently. I think it has to do with modeling, has to do with a lot of predictions. So the idea I got here is going to be very useful to me. Perfect, perfect. It's great to hear it. And also, I think. Uh, like the combination of this workflow with the add-in that I've shown in the start of our meeting is is possibly very very powerful, like because you don't have to like manually manually code like the different model specification. Um, the last thing that I wanted to like to throw in the air is um, I can't remember. I think it was chapter four, like last chapter or the chapter before. That we've seen how to like, uh, we've we've talked about how in like uh, tuning parameters you have like the grid search and the iterative search um, strategy strategies. And then um, we've seen a way to like create an iterative search based on a grid search, right? Like you create like, like this first grid search, for example, like four or nine points for each model, and then uh, based on this like initial grid, you can create an iterative search that's starting from the best point on the grid, right? Um, so I was wondering how this uh, like idea of like um, integrative um, search strategies might be combined with like the workflow sets um, kind of idea because here we only use like a pretty small grid search approach, like which where in every grid we have, we only have three points. Um, so I, uh, you know, I don't expect anyone to have the answer. It's just like a, a thought that uh, came to my mind when I read the, this book because um, if if one has like unlimited or very high computing power power, then I guess this might be a very very strong. Um, modeling strategy. Um, okay, so um, if no one has any more uh, thoughts or, or something to say, then uh, let's look at next week, maybe. Um, this currently, oh, I think we've lost Federica on the most important part. Um, Okay, so I I see that uh, next week currently no one is is written, uh, but after that, uh, Mailing and uh, Wafemi has like two um, uh, is volunteered. Um, so uh, Freya. Uh, do you think next week might be possible for you? And if not, I guess Federico would take it? I think it is a possibility. I think I initially said I'm willing if I'm free. 
slightly it's possible I might be needed in the office in which case it might be difficult but I'm hoping not in which case I'd like to like to do it and hopefully I can update by the end of this week if I'm for some reason not able to okay perfect so since Federica isn't here I think it might be best if you write in the chat or in the in the slack mm -hmm. um that this is like your situation so uh Federica will know that like uh, she can wait a few days and then uh, she will see based on your decision if she's uh, preparing the chapter or not. Okay. Oh, wait, I forgot to write end. Sorry. 